Okay, I'd like to welcome everybody. My name is Carter Brandon. I'm a senior fellow with the World Resources Institute. And I'm a member of the GlassNet uh, network, which is a network that um, is interested in how global and local issues interact and one knowledge about one supports and feeds the other. We need global understanding to help us prioritize and act at the local level. And of course, we need local understanding to prioritize and act at the global level. So it doesn't matter if you go local, global, local, or global, local, global. Um, it's all about the interaction. And uh, when we, um, uh, this is a, a network that's about, uh, I don't know, Tom, a year, year and a half old. Um, but um, at the end of last year, we decided to uh, create through a sort of a crowdsourcing competitive process, some use cases that would be exemplary of how we can analyze, diagnose and act, um, ideally influence decision makers on issues that have these characteristics of leaking local and global. So there are, I forget exactly how many, maybe five, I think use cases we have. And this is the first workshop to actually drill down on the content. And the point of this is not just to hear how uh, the use cases played out, but to actually see how GlassNet, which is a, a fantastically rich network of people can contribute. We can contribute ideas, we can contribute methodology, um, we can con uh, contribute maybe even in the final applications of these use cases as we try to uh, learn, uh, and change and scale up. And maybe we've heard that term scaling up a lot, but that's exactly what we're trying to do. So we have a great program. Uh, we have uh, presentations by the two um, uh, main presenters, Sabrina Eisenbarth um, at the University of Exeter and Ian Bateman also at the University of Exeter, uh, talking about an example in England. We also have four discussants. We'll hear from the presenters for maybe um, 35, 40, 45 minutes, and then we'll hear from the uh, discussants, and then we will have a good half an hour for discussion. Uh, this is a, um, a bit, um, uh, we have plenty of time. We have two hours, so it's longer than almost usual for this kind of session because we do encourage the interaction between the GlassNet members and the use case presenters. Uh, so with that, I think we'll just probably jump right into it. And uh, maybe I think, uh, Sabrina, I think you're first, if you wanna jump in. Uh, I should give you the actual name of the use case, but I don't see it here in my notes. Um, help me out here, Sabrina. Isn't Tell me the actual name. <laughs> <laughs> Creating yeah. the UK's new wetlands. There we go. Um, Thank you very much. Please jump in. Great, thank you very much. Um, we have prepared some slides, um, but I don't seem to have um, host rights to share them. It would be great if I could get those. Um, and could that be uh, extended to myself uh, and Brett, please? Because uh, we're all, go all three it. of us are actually going to. I, th I think it's, you should be able to go now. Give it a try. Yes. Um, great. Can you see the slides? Yeah, that's great. Wonderful. So thank you very much for inviting us uh, to present today and for accepting Net Zero Plus as a um, use case. So our project looks at um, one of the greatest woodland expansions um, we have seen in a very long time, um, which will be happening in the UK with the goal of sequestering carbon um, and delivering other co-benefits for biodiversity, water and recreation. And so um, what our goal for this presentation today is, is to give you a bit of an overview of the Net Zero Plus project and the research that we're doing to identify uh, where we would plant those trees, what kind of trees to plant um, and when to achieve these um, objectives. And it's really an invitation for you to uh, participate and give feedback, um, hoping that we can collaborate um, on research um, in the future. 
to give you a bit of an overview of who's involved on our end, uh, particularly today. So um, I'm the first one to present. Um, you will later hear from Professor Brett Day and Professor Ian Bateman, who um, are both um, at the University of Exeter and working on the Net Zero Plus project as well um, as environmental economists. Um, and um, I just wanted to flag um, that Kate Gannon has been um, immensely supportive in this work. And um, while she's not presenting today, she uh, has been um, a co-lead in this use case application and deserves a lot of credit for the things that you will hear um, about today. So to give you a quick overview of what, what's going to happen, so we'll provide you an overview of the different um, um, work, work streams that are happening under a net zero plus. And in particular, uh, in particular we will um, highlight how we inf influence policymaking and tree planting in the UK through our research. So we have very close links uh, with the UK government and Ian will talk more about um, that. Um, and then Brett will present um, the UK farm mo model, which um, is used to understand um, how policies implemented in the UK um, um, influence farmers' decisions and wood plant woodland planting decisions. And uh, I will then talk about uh, local global linkage in our project, where we look at uh, um, global repercussions of woodland planting in the UK, in particular at carbon leakage um, across the globe. And then finally, if we have a bit of time at the end, and maybe Brett will say a word about uh, emulation and innovative um, AI methods we are using in this um, project. So I will now hand over uh, to Ian um, for the first part of the presentation. Ian, do you want me to click through or do you want to share yourself? I'd rather share myself because uh, yeah. as ever, there's far too many animations in it. So I'm going to try and share. And let's give that a go. And can you see my slides okay? Yeah. Uh, that's interesting. Okay. Let's try that one more time. Okay. Great. Okay. So that's where we were. So um, we are very, very keen. Uh, to use this um, workshop to uh, try and encourage collaboration between uh, other GlassNet members and ourselves. And so there is um, a, a little element uh, of uh, salesmanship in this um, talk, I'm afraid, uh, in that we're going to try and show you how incredibly exciting uh, the Net Zero Plus uh, project is. Um, it's, it's fabulous opportunities for working with um, decision makers. And hopefully at the end of it, uh, you'll feel that you just simply have to get uh, in touch and, um, and collaborate uh, with the project, which we'd be very, very keen uh, to do. So just starting off with that, um, we are actually building on um, a good, uh, well, more than a decade now of advising uh, the UK government at uh, cabinet level. Uh, in particular, uh, we've uh, uh, been direct advisors to uh, what's called the Chancellor of the Exchequer, which uh, it, I, I imagine in the US is probably called the finance minister or something like that. Uh, so the, the, the head honcho uh, in, in terms of the money side, and uh, he sits in the treasury, and also the Secretary of State for the Environment, who uh, is the cabinet minister, the senior cabinet minister for the uh, environment. And uh, things that we've um, uh, directly advised on include the two documents that you can see here. So on the left, the 25 year plan for the environment, um, which uh, we, we had a, a direct input to in terms of both its conceptual framing, which is a natural capital framing, but also quite a lot of the uh, uh, sort of uh, policies inside that. And those have informed uh, the uh, 2020 Agriculture Act and the 2021 Environment Act. And uh, in particular, one of the main uh, initiatives there was to move uh, funding 
away from uh, a very untargeted flat rate approach. Everybody gets the same, irrespective of whether your land is fantastic or utterly rubbish for existing services, to one where um, that uh, subsidy amount, which is very substantial in the UK, we're talking about 50% of farm incomes are subsidies. So it's a, a huge intervention. Um, and, and now that's going to be targeted towards public goods. And uh, Brett uh, is leading the work with the uh, Environment uh, Department on that. Uh, the other uh, document there is the Treasury Green Book, which actually isn't anything to do with the environment. These are the gu guidelines uh, for all government spending. And um, we've uh, managed to move that uh, in the same direction so that now it is a natural capital document. It, see, it sees that as the approach to take and you have to think about how uh, every project will affect natural capital stocks and the values that are going to be derived from it. And in, in effect, uh, government uh, policy has to pass a cost benefit test in the UK. Uh, we've also got huge numbers of uh, private sector um, uh, partners involved. And some of these are really big. Uh, so Network Rail uh, owns huge amounts of land and all the rails uh, across the whole of uh, the UK. Uh, similarly, National Trust, uh, the Forestry Commission um, owns about 10% of the country. So there's, a, there's very large amounts of uh, land uh, 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 involved as, as partnerships with us. So uh, if that interests you if, you, if you're interested in actually having an involvement with um, uh, policymakers, private and public sector, uh, please do get uh, in touch. Now, the approach that we're taking um, although the, the funding is for uh, the uh, removal of greenhouse gases from the atmosphere, our approach is very holistic. And uh, it says, really, we're not only looking at a, uh, a massive problem in terms of emissions and their impact on the climate, but also at the same time, we see uh, biodiversity collapse and natural capital being degraded uh, extremely fast. This is a complex challenge. Uh, the impacts that you have uh, on uh, these three uh, elements vary um, with the location of any intervention and, of course, what type of intervention that is. And so when people sort of say, well, the simple solution is to just plant a tree, um, what we're saying as it is actually it's a bit more complex than that. So I want to overview the um, uh, Net Zero Plus research program, showing where the connection with um, uh, Glasner is, but really trying to encourage you to see all the other connections from that work uh, across uh, the whole program and uh, encouraging you to uh, get in touch and get involved with this. So, the first part of uh, what we're doing is to actually model the drivers of land use change. And Brett's going to talk uh, in depth about that and how that allows us to understand what current land use is, but also to understand how it can be changed uh, in multiple respects. So, yes, uh, greenhouse gases, but also just the simple stuff like food production, incomes, that sort of stuff, the stuff that actually decision makers, um, well, I would say when push comes to shove, are actually more interested in um, at the moment. And there, uh, of course, is the direct linkage to uh, the Glassnet uh, work, because every time we plant a tree, uh, there is the potential that we may be displacing agricultural uh, production and therefore inducing uh, changes in food imports and therefore greenhouse gas leakage. Uh, we do hope uh, that uh, the work with Glassnet will allow us to quantify this um, uh, very precisely that we can actually model it so that we can go right the way through from um, 
uh, altering one of those drivers of change, uh, seeing how land use responds and seeing how that leads to uh, greenhouse gas leakage. We also have partners uh, with us that uh, we're pretty confident will allow us to, once that's done, to then move straight on and do uh, biodiversity leakage as well. We're very fortunate to have uh, Andrew Bromford uh, linked in on that. Now, uh, changing land use isn't just, a, 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 you might be surprised that an economist will say this, it's actually not just about incentives, because uh, there's some uh, real problems in the UK. For example, about 40% of the land is tenanted, it's not owned by the farmer, which typically means that every time you uh, increase uh, grants and subsidies, uh, it just passes straight through the farmer's hands and straight to the owner. So in effect, the incentive uh, is massively reduced. So we're bringing those sort of complexities into the modelling as well. When you do all this and combine it with the other drives of change, that gives you uh, a very, very wide uh, set of uh, potential uh, land use futures. Uh, you know, there's eight little maps there. Actually, we're talking about thousands of possible uh, futures. Each one of those uh, generates a whole series of benefits and costs. And of course, the one that we're uh, charged to look at is uh, looking at uh, greenhouse gas removal. And you can see uh, the consequences of planting uh, different trees in different places uh, upon that greenhouse gas removal. But of course, you also need to think about all the other contributors to that net greenhouse gas uh, change. So obviously soils, but also how it's affecting other land uses uh, is extremely important here. And all of this uh, happens over time. So you've, it's not just a spatial analysis, it's temporal because you've got things like uh, the fact that some species will be very good for producing um, products which will last a very long time into the future, say uh, construction timber, that sort of stuff, while other species might grow extremely fast, but actually produce very low grade um, uh, 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 storage, uh, which will soon be emitted back into the atmosphere. And there's um, some wonderfully uh, fiendish problems as well in terms of things like uh, changing pest and disease risk and changing fire risk over time. Uh, and all of this, the whole lot responds to climate change, of course. That's not just the trees, that's the agriculture as well. And again, we'll talk about that more uh, in a bit. But then there's all the other effects uh, that you need to bring into this. Biodiversity obviously is probably the, uh, the one most on uh, politicians' minds, but there's lots of other uh, impacts as well, impacts on the water environment, which uh, again result in issues on water quality, water quantity, flooding, um, and carbon storage within the uh, marine environment, and also the potential to produce food in ways which might be much lower uh, emission than our conventional uh, terrestrial production, particularly of proteins. All of this looks pretty complex, and so you have to have a decision support system. Uh, this is not the sort of thing that uh, a civil servant is going to be able to work out on the back of an envelope um, because everything is changing across space, across time uh, and across uh, a lot of other policy parameters. So one of the really exciting things that uh, I think Net Zero Plus is doing is producing decision support, which actually uh, can move in two directions. And Brett's going to talk about the, um, the way in which we're doing that. It's basically through uh, emulation of a lot of quite complex um, scientific and economic processes. But that's going to allow us to move from policy to planting uh, to outcomes, but also has the potential for a truly novel approach to decision support. Well, we think it's really novel, where you reverse that cycle and you say to decision makers, what are the outcomes that you want? And from that, you work back to the planting um, uh, land use and the policy um, uh, that, uh, that actually fits with that. 
Uh, Brett leads a, a, a pretty fantastic uh, initiative within LEAP, uh, which develops this decision support. Uh, at the moment, it's called the Natural Environment Evaluation Tool, uh, sometimes uh, also called NEVO when it's online. This allows you to select any area in the country. This could be via a grid or via some uh, uh, natural uh, units, say subcatchments, and to look at all the consequences of uh, present situations, but also changes in those situations. And those consequences being measured both in physical units and uh, where appropriate uh, economic units. And uh, Britt's going to take you through some of the uh, model, but, but in, in essence, you've got elements that uh, actually allow you to look at the drivers of change of land use, then understand the environmental processes uh, that come out of that, quite a diversity of different processes, and finally, the e-system services and economic values uh, that, uh, that they produce. Uh, and uh, at the risk of uh, boring Carter and uh, Steve, who were at this talk uh, uh, last week, the consequences of this are pretty important. So, for example, um, the government has said it's it's going to it, it's going to plant three quarters of a million hectares of forestry. That immediately is the wrong way to do it because actually you should be planting to a store carbon and not just measuring the number of hectares. But, you know, uh, we, we can uh, help them out with that. But also they're going to do something which is very common and simply wrong. And that is to take public money and throw it on the table and just leave it to the market to see who picks that money up. And of course, if you do that, which is, a, is extremely common, uh, even around the world, then what you're doing is allowing that planting to be determined by the level of subsidies and the uh, opportunity cost in terms of foregone agricultural production. Um, what you're ignoring here is the uh, non-market benefits, which are ostensibly the thing that is driving this policy. And so you end up with planting such as uh, here, where really that, that money is preferentially taken up by uh, the, the worst land uh, in, in the UK and produces really bad results. In fact, it actually leads to emissions, net emissions of carbon uh, as you see planting uh, take place on very high carbon soils. Instead, we can do this in a completely different way and to actually target that planting according to the uh, different ecosystem services uh, that they produce. Most of them can be valued. Uh, we argue that biodiversity is best assessed actually uh, without uh, monetary values, but in terms of, uh, for example, constraints, uh, net gain constraints, for example. And if you do that, uh, you plant in very different and generate uh, much better benefit cost outcomes. Okay, I'm now going to hand over to Brett, who is going to tell you about uh, the farm model and uh, some other aspects of uh, the uh, Net Zero Plus project. Brett. You have to stop sharing in, otherwise I can't um, start. Of course, <laughs> apologies, thank you. Uh, now, which screen? That screen. You'd have thought after these last few years, I'd know how to do this. How's that looking? Yeah, looks good. You, um, you, you, you're just seeing something say farm model, are you? Yeah. Yeah. Good. So now we're delving down into the, the local where we started. Uh, a little bit of detail on this, which is going to be one of the core parts in which we start interacting uh, with the, the global. This is our, our farm model where, if I'm on the right screen, we're incredibly lucky in that we're working directly with the government in uh, trying to develop an understanding of how farmers are going to respond to incentives, both for tree planting, but also you might have heard that we made a very interesting decision to leave the EU here. And therefore, we're thinking about ways in which we can also incentivize uh, a new agri-environment policy, as Ian's been talking about. So the need for a very detailed understanding of how farmers respond to various drivers is uh, paramount in government. And we've been lucky enough to be deeply involved in that. Why that's good for us is it gives us access, 
I, I'm going to say unprecedented, certainly unprecedented in my experience, detail on what's going on on farming in GB at the moment. I've just distinguished between GB, which is United Kingdom minus Northern Ireland, because actually getting hold of the data for Northern Ireland is a little bit tricky. So everything I'm talking about is, is going to be a GB context. But what we know from working with them, and I've got to go through these quickly because you're not really supposed to see this sort of thing, but these are, these are we know where the actual farms are. So that's, that's great. And it's not that it's all one contiguous area. Farmers own patches of land all over the landscape, all of which contribute to uh, an entity which is a farm business. Uh, we know what livestock they are. There's detailed records of where livestock are and how they're transferred between farms and various other parts of the food system. That's fantastic. We know what crops are growing with really great uh, resolution data on crop that's been building up in the UK uh, from remote sensing, but cross tabulated with information that's provided to the government. And we also know what grass they're growing. Of course, uh, livestock is a major part of UK agriculture. So this is going to be an important part of that. So this very detailed data. And from that, we are well partway through developing um, a whole farm. So we're looking at how the whole farm operates. Parcel scale. Parcel is the UK word for field. So I'll switch between field and parcel. Uh, of cropping and livestock production in Great Britain. That's what we're aiming for. I'll give you a little inkling of, of what are the key assumptions behind that. I know you don't need too much detail, but uh, this just shows you through some of the elements. We're first off understanding arable and pasture and crop rotation, what's going on in the land. When we understand that for a farm, we're also trying to understand the stocking densities and how they're managing their pasture for both food for the animals and to store as forage, which they're going to keep for the winter or to sell on. Uh, for each of those things, then we're in a good position to uh, bring together information on the costs and revenues that come from the farming activities, which brings us to ability to talk about the farm. So farm specific uh, profitability, uh, plus understanding even at the field scale of margins. Now, that, that's really useful. Um, it's really into the detail, probably not detail that you're particularly interested in, but it begins allowing us to think about how farmers might take land out of production, which parcels they might take out of production in order to uh, begin thinking about planting forests. And that might not be the whole farm. It might just be a field which happens to be slightly a long way from the farm, and therefore more difficult to get the tractor to. A whole bunch of things that we can take account of when working in this uh, incredibly fine resolution. Um, the outputs that will come out of this model uh, that will feed into the global uh, are very detailed and we realise we're going to have to aggregate and that's one of the things that we'll be uh, attempting to do as we start engaging with the uh, the GTAP and the international elements of this uh, whole modelling exercise. So we can have detailed information on production of crops, we can have detailed information on forage, so this is both crops grown for forage like maize but also uh, different forms of grassland. We have detailed predictions or uh, estimates in the first instance for the current situation of a dairy, beef, sheep and goats. We, we don't deal with other types of farming. So uh, certainly with poultry and um, pigs, which are fairly specialised forms of farming, we don't do much detail on those. Plus lots of ex extras. Um, I'll talk about the farm characterization. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff here on fixed costs. That's going to be important. Land tenure, how that affects things. Ian's already talked about that. Uh, so incredibly detailed information on those things. The way the model is going to work, and now we're starting to think about, well, what can this model tell us about the future? Is first off, we're categorising time farms by their type. And you can see the categorization that used in government on the right-hand side here, cereals, general cropping, specialists, etc. cetera. Um, within a type, it's fairly easy to change management and crop rotation and stocking density. So these are really changing variable costs or some other costs as well. But to move across types usually requires some substantial investment or potentially disinvestment, might be losing stuff. So, for example, moving from cereals to dairy, obviously a dairy farm requires quite a lot of capital investment in order to make that change. So these have capital, capital costs to the farm business type. So those decisions are made on a slightly different uh, cycle. And each farm has a feasible set of possible farm types. So you can be any one of these farm types on the right. Well, you might not be able to because your land might not accommodate certain types of them. But also you can move to forestry or agroforestry or some new type. And by new types, we're thinking into the future about the possibility that farming systems that aren't currently in the UK might become part of the UK makeup. So we'll take analogues 
from Europe uh, moving steadily south to, to look at different climates, to think about what sorts of uh, farming might be possible here. An example being viniculture, which is just starting to uh, take off in the UK. So small areas are turning to growing grapes and that's a, a new farm type and we'll have the possibility to bring those in. How are we going to do this? Well, um, we have to understand how active sculpture activity, by which I mean farmer or landowner or land manager decisions are made. And we're going to drive those by three key things. Climate, which is going to determine what you can uh, grow. Um, input and output prices, which is going to determine the, uh, the profitability of different approaches. And of course, where we step in, which is changing policies and regulations, which might encourage you to do other things, such as subsidising tree growth or stopping you doing certain things on your land, all of which should be able to, uh, to model through this modelling setup. And I think the key thing uh, to dwell on just for a second is how we're going to do this with respect to yields well, we're working on this now so this is a uh, latest thing that we're bringing into the model and that's that we're using a, a yield model a crop model um, which can tell us the production the yield outcomes of different crops and grasses given the soil the crop the weather and the management so those are the two variables and within the uk again we're very lucky that we have a uh, very detailed uh, weather projections going into the future under different climate uh, futures, which allow us to think how these different crops might respond. Again, those are probabilistic as well. So they give us some idea of the uncertainties over different futures of weather and of climate. Um, so yields are going to determine this management choice within farm type. Uh, and we can also get to these yields of alternative new types such that we can start thinking, well, are farmers going to continue doing what they're doing or as climate changes or as we change input and output prices or policies and regulation, will farmers decide that it's a good idea to switch to a different form of farming? And that brings us to the final part of the model, which is decision making and uh, being an economist. In fact, we're all economists from the Exeter team here, so we're all very happy with this, not necessarily. Everyone agrees that farmers are driven solely by optimization of profits, but it's a very good place to start. So we think about farmers being driven by profits within the context of their tenure agreements, the rights they have to do things on the land and the policy environment. So it's not just profits. They're not free to do whatever they want. And they have an annual choice within their type of, of, of management and what they're going to do, but they can also choose to switch type. And this is where we begin to think ahead. And these farmers are uh, so so uh, this is the management decision within their type I'm talking about here. So now they're thinking about thinking about the different weathers they might focus, they might face over the, the coming year when they're thinking about how they're going to crop over that year. And they're going to be making those decisions in a, in a risk averse, under uncertainty, optimization way. So we'll be parameterizing their risk aversity and thinking they're going to choose in order to optimize a, a risk averse utility function. If that makes sense to the economists, basically they're making risk averse decisions about how to plant their, uh, their crops or grow their grass or stock their land. Type change is more substantial because that involves this fixed cost so now we've got to think ahead and they're thinking more, not just about weather, but about climate and how that's uh, changing into the future and thinking about a present value comparison across the different types of farming they could do. I could be a dairy, I could be cereal, I could be mainly concentrating on forestry or I could be moving into viniculture might be options. Of course, those requires investments and I've got to think long term about whether those investments are going to pay off in a changing climate. So again, a, a, a slightly longer term decision process here, risk averse optimization under uncertainty as well will drive the decision process in that place in that way okay so that's our farm model that's the level it will tell you all this detail it will show us how farming in the uk is going to respond uh, i'm going to do this briefly because this is what spring is going on to but that will link into the global because we're going to be able to bring out this model as we change policies in a changing climate projections of how gb agricultural production is going to change that's going to be very fine resolution at our end for crops and livestock but obviously we can aggregate that up of course, the GB agricultural landscape doesn't live in isolation of the rest of the world. So the second thing we're interested in is thinking about, well, how will changes in the GB affect world markets and will those have feedbacks effects? And I think that's the best place to switch over to Sabrina, who's going to tell you more about this linking our local world with the global world. Great. Thank you very much, Brett. I'll just share my slides again.
Great. Can you see them? Yeah, that looks great. Uh, thanks. Um, so as Brad already mentioned, so we're going to link the global, uh, the local um, events in the UK to um, to what happens in the world more broadly. And the idea is um, that tree planting in the UK would potentially replace other land uses, um, mostly agricultural land. And if we assume that uh, demand stays relatively constant, that may mean that we have to import these agricultural products from somewhere else in the world. Right? Um, and if we do that, um, then that may increase greenhouse gas emissions um, outside of the UK. Um, so, okay, this isn't. So in the rest of the world, you could potentially have higher greenhouse gas emissions, as you see here, from agricultural production. And you could also have higher greenhouse gas emissions from land use change um, that results from this agricultural production. Um, now, in the UK, on the other hand, you have re uh, reduced agricultural greenhouse gas emissions um, um, and carbon, um, uh, carbon sequestration in, in UK forests. Now, whether the policy like the carbon sequestration and the pol uh, policy in the UK is worth it or not really depends on how big these uh, global leakage um, effects are in comparison to what we're saving in the UK. Right, so you could imagine the worst case scenario where you reduce um, agricultural, where the reduced agricultural emissions in the UK um, are lower than the agricultural emissions that are generated from producing those foods abroad. Right, so this could happen um, if emission intensities abroad are higher. And it could also be the case that carbon sequestration in UK forests is lower than uh, the greenhouse gas emissions that um, originate from deforestation and land use change abroad. And so in the very worst case, afforestation in the UK could lead to a net increase in um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions globally. And that is the scenario that we definitely would want to avoid, right? And so it means that we have to carefully study um, the trade effects that are caused by our um, um, afforestation policy in the UK uh, in order to minimize leakage um, and um, basically achieve a, a real a net um, greenhouse gas sequestration uh, benefits um, uh, across the world. And so in order um, to investigate this, we need to understand the effects of changes in afforestation on UK, UK supply of agricultural products and timber products. And all of this will come out of the agricultural model that, uh, that Brett just um, explained. And, and um, the goal in the work package that I'm leading is to understand, okay, what happens if we plant trees and reduce agricultural um, um, supply um, in the UK. Does this have an effect on UK and world market uh, prices for agricultural products and timber? As you could imagine that the supply declines in the UK um, and therefore world market prices increase slightly. Or it may also be that that is not the case. We have to understand how big those price effects could potentially be. Um, we want to understand how um, how um, potential reductions in agricultural supply affect import and export patterns for agricultural products and timber. Um, so we may be importing or we will probably be importing more food in, uh, from the rest of the world, but we might also just be exporting more, less food to other countries. And so those uh, countries have to be sourcing um, that food from elsewhere or increasing uh, have, or they have to increase their own productions, now production. Um, the associated changes um, in agricultural supply abroad um, that are necessary for these for the production of um, imports or for the replacement of exports um, could le lead to overseas land use change in uh, different countries or regions. Um, and so our goal is to um, understand uh, that land use change. And ultimately, we are interested uh, in the effects on greenhouse gas emissions in other countries or regions. And so, as I said, we, like, it's important to understand the emissions um, that originate from land use change and deforestation, um, but also the CO2 and non-CO2 uh, emissions from agricultural production um, and um, basically um, effects that translate to the, uh, through the entire supply chain. Uh, supply chain. 
Um, and finally, if trade patterns change, then transport emissions may change. I suppose that's a smaller margin, uh, but it's another dimension in which um, afforestation in the UK could lead um, to changes in emissions globally. And one way we think um, this could be studied really well is uh, through the use of the um, GTAB AZ greenhouse gas emissions model. So we have been talking with Ala Golub in particular, and uh, we're hopefully close to uh, drawing up a collaboration agreement with uh, Purdue to work with her and uh, other uh, people at Purdue. Um, the, um, we, we strongly encourage um, input on, on that dimension, uh, mostly because um, while I have been working on trade and the environment for a long time, um, um, I myself am not a proficient in CGE modeling, so we have no CGE modeling uh, expertise in our team. And so I am currently uh, starting to learn and currently with Eric Nielsen, who um, joined us as a PhD student recently and who is on the call as well. Um, so Eric, if you just want to quickly say hi so people see you. Um. Sure. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, yeah, so the two of us um, are basically building up expertise uh, internally, but um, um, obviously it'll take a while be before we're at the research frontier and uh, we strongly encourage um, or and welcome um, collaboration on that dimension. Um, from um, other members of the GTAP network who may, may be interested in that. Now, as I said, we um, want to understand how um, tree planting and changes in agricultural supply um, affect um, world market prices, right? Um, but the, the, the basically the tree planting decisions and the changes in agricultural supply um, currently come out of the UK farm model, which um, at the moment still treats prices uh, as endogenous. So if we use GTAP to understand how global prices may respond to UK policies, we would ideally want to feed those prices back into the UK farm model um, uh, to endogenize them and have a realistic uh, way of assessing um, um, basically price trajectories and um, determinants of um, decision-making amongst farmers in the UK. So that this is where we uh, bring the local to the global and then back to the local through these price mechanisms um, and how they affect um, farm decisions in the UK. There are other drivers um, of land use and that we are um, trying to understand. Um, for one thing, it's possible that um, UK diets may change substantially towards more um, plant-based uh, diets. We, we're already uh, seeing um, starting trend in that. And um, if this continues, then that may um, affect the need to import agricultural products from elsewhere um, um, and um, would affect import demand. Um, and that in turn would imply that leakage would be lower and um, policy um, or optimal policies may be affected by that. But more importantly, for, uh, from my point of view, is that we want to um, understand um, climate change as a driver of land use decisions in the UK. Um, as Brett already mentioned, um, so temperature and rainfall will change and that will change farmers' um, revenue from, um, or it will change agricultural yields and revenue from um, particular crops. Um, and that will potentially change planting um, and land use decisions in the UK. Now, to be consistent um, across different parts of the Net Zero Plus project, we want to make sure we don't only model um, climate change in, in the UK for a model, but we also want to model the effects of climate change in the rest of the world. And so, so in order to model climate, uh, global climate impacts, um, so, People have um, usually just modeled um, changes in um, agricultural yields, and uh, we thought that um, the data from the ACMAP tool would be a, a good way of incorporating um, those um, climate predictions into um, a TTAB. And um, basically, the, 
um, get um, yield trajectories that are consistent um, across uh, modeling parts of the net zero plus project. So uh, consistent um, across the farm model and um, the analysis that we would be doing um, in GTAP. And so here the question is still one of which, um, which crop models and which climate models in combination would be the best ones um, to use and um, to be consistent across um, models um, in, in the wider net zero plus umbrella. But I think from my point of view, the bigger challenge at the moment is to also bring um, the effect of climate change on forest in, into GTAP. So we have a very detailed um, modeling suit um, in Net Zero Plus led by um, scientists looking at the effect of climate change um, on forests. Um, <clears throat> and ideally, we would um, be doing a similar thing um, within um, GTAP as well. So we would bring in a consistent um, approach of modeling climate effects on forest fields um, in GTAP. And well, basically understand um, how changes of, uh, in climate in the UK and in, in the rest of the world um, affect these leakage estimates that we are um, interested in. And so I think in, in this dimension, um, we still don't have a good solution of how we could do this and which um, data set we could um, use to incorporate changes in forestry yields um, in, in, in this GTAP analysis of um, carbon leakage. And so I will just skip the slide um, and just basically make this um, uh, or emphasize that we invite participation and collaboration on all of those aspects, um, um, particularly on GTAP and modeling of trade links, obviously also in other parts of the product uh, of the project, but um, modeling these climate futures um, and agricultural and forestry um, impacts of climate change within GTAP is something that um, it will still be on our uh, agenda and that we're looking to bring in. So I think, we, uh, or I hope we still have a little bit of time um, and I'll hand over to Brett um, so that he can um, talk about emulation and how we're bringing all of this um, into one decision support tool. Do you, do you want to take over Brett? Try to keep it brief, Brett, but please go ahead. Can't hear you, Brett. You're muted. You're muted. Do, do you want me to? I can I can um, flounder around and uh, try and explain. Uh, yep. <laughs> okay. That's great. <laughs> okay. So um, it really goes back to. Uh, what I was saying at the um, at the end of, uh, of the slides I gave. So no, I'm back uh, in. Sorry. Oh, you're back. All right. Okay. Well, I'm sorry, <laughs> well, everybody. Uh, Brett's back. Not quite certain what happened there. The uh, oh, I can't get that one to work. So I mean, I think there's a number of things that's worth adding on. I'm going to do this relatively rapidly because I know we're taking up quite a lot of time. There's uh, the the questions about um, what happens when we do stuff in the UK are important. Our initial uh, in Examinations of these also show that those decisions, uh, when made under uncertainty, are very, very different from when making decisions assuming some sort of future. So a lot of the things we want to look about, uh, and these are upfront decisions now about how much land we're going to take out of production in the next, well, 10 years. I mean, the, the plans, are, plans are huge uh, in order to put into tree planting. Uh, so they're upfront, long-term decisions, difficult to come back from them. So we're making these decisions uh, in really quite a lot of uncertainty about what the future is going to look like. And when we look at different climate futures, we see that different trees in different parts of the country do well. So making these decisions uh, with this uh, view to uncertainty is critical. That takes us into a modelling framework in which, if my screen will share, which hopefully it will, you can just can see it in this mode because uh, I'm a little bit worried that it's going to um, freeze on me again. Let's. Um, can you see that? Sorry, uncertainty. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, good. Okay, so um, uh, this is the one that's frozen. I'm just going to stop that, and we'll see how we get on. 
to achieve that, we've got to be able to look at lots and lots and lots of different outcomes and lots and lots of different climate futures and lots and lots of different pricing futures for agriculture to understand what the whole range of outcomes are. Uh, to do that, we've teamed up with uh, data scientists who are experts in model emulation. So the models that we've talked about already, and Ian to talk to you through a couple of those, I've talked to you through the farm model, we see GTAP and its uh, ancillary models as being parts of this modeling network. We're going to join those guys to develop emulations of them. So emulations are, and I presume that people sort of understand this, but uh, so I hope I'm not patronizing on, but very fast running statistical approximations to model, which can be made as precise as you'd like to the original model, depending on what you're trying to achieve. So we'll bring these emulations in. These emulations become mathematical objects. And what's brilliant about them, the technology they're using, which is a, a deep Gaussian process form of statistical uh, estimation, is that they can bring uncertainty through them. We can work with all the uncertainty and run those through this set of models, thinking how our policy is going to lead to changes in farming, to changes in uh, trade prices, uh, to changes in offshore emissions right the way through to biodiversity and greenhouse gases in the UK. But more so than that, because these are now mathematical objects, we can work from the end backwards and invert those emulations, these mathematical objects of these models, and start asking ourselves, well, if we want to achieve certain things, what sort of planting landscapes and what sort of policies deliver them? So I think there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in this uh, teaming up with the mathematicians and the data scientists to bring in this uh, approach to emulations of model networks, which will allow us to look at some even more complicated but critical questions in making these decisions about forest planting in the UK. I think I did my two minutes. Is that a good point to uh, turn to the rest? Very much so. Thanks. I'm in a very empty room, so part of the echo is in my room. Uh, well, thanks very much. I, I, I uh, wanted to emphasize that part of GlassNet is not just local and global, which we've heard a lot about, but it's also science to economics and back again, which we've also heard a lot about. Um, we'll turn to the, uh, to the uh, commenters now, the reviewers, but I just wanted to flag two issues that I'm particularly interested in and I'll be listening for. One is you know, the, the, the local decision-making with the decision support system, you've prioritized carbon and we get that. But at the local level, a farmer is making decisions across a broader set of issues. We also know that and, and Ian referenced a lot of those in, the, in his introduction. So how, how does that fit? What sort of, uh, is, there, is there a lot of alignment or not in, 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 in the scope of the decisions the farmer makes given the objective that you've set to yourself, which is specifically carbon? And then the second thing I'm gonna be looking for is between local and global is sort of the meso level, which again, as uh, Ian uh, flagged, we want a, an approach that's very efficient in land use. And what are the mechanisms to achieve that? Because it actually goes beyond individual farmers to achieve probably uh, grouping and sort of spatial grouping, et cetera. Anyway, I don't want to take more time. The first commenter is going to be uh, Maxim Chapaliev, who's actually with GTAP at uh, Purdue. So uh, you've heard the request from this team, Maxim, to work with you. And so let's hear your response. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the presentation and for the introduction. It's like very exciting um, and great example, I think, of the ongoing collaborations and especially it's interesting to see this level of details, you know, and, and then really potential for linkages to the rest of the world, which is also kind of uh, very unusual. And, and the fact that you're also looking into land use based mitigation and non CO2 greenhouse gas mitigation and then trying to link it to the CG models like GTAP is also very exciting because in particular, it's it's a relatively uh, non-trivial issue, yeah, and, and that's why there are not many studies that do it, because it's hard to parameterize the cost of this mitigation, including mitigation not well, land use as well as non-CO2 like methane and nitrous oxide, so developing this kind of marginal abatement cost curves and then uh, plugging them into the model is, is, a, um, is a relatively kind of uh, tough task. So, and, and that's why I think it's, it's also valuable uh, in, within your project. So I 
I, I have a number of comments and, and it's really hard to kind of distinguish like a smaller picture de details from, from a global view because uh, there are so many things packed, packed into this. Um, so I'll, I'll probably start with kind of like a hypothetical framework of how GTAP or TG model can be linked into the analysis that you're using. And then along the lines of discussing this, I'll just go through some, some particular details. Um, so my understanding is that you're already kind of thinking on how to link the GTAP or ZGG to, to, to the uh, frameworks that you have. And, and I think one critical choice that you would be facing in here is whether you um, should use like a static representation, like a static uh, CG model, or more like move into the dynamic, uh, probably like a recursive dynamic framework. And, and that's of course a very valid point and, and there are benefits and drawbacks in, in both of them. Yeah, so with, with a static framework, uh, there is a better opportunity for doing like sensitivity analysis, running more simulations or you know, doing, let's say, one jump into, into the future and then representing that particular year, like 2040, 2060, whatever you're focusing on. And, and then you know, the computational kind of capacities is somewhat lower with, with this representation. With a recursive dynamic framework, um, it's it's harder to do any like sensitivities changing underlying parameterization, but in general it's much better perceived by policymakers. At least that's what we find from from our kind of communications because you show a pathway and, and you can implement policies over time and and kind of better explain this. Let's say you you increase attacks by ten percent a year and, and that's what's happening. So I think that's that's one of the choices that. Um, yeah, we you would need to, to think through and, and kind of uh, discuss. So one other point I think that can be also brought into the framework. So you, you're talking about um, links from local UK uh, policies to the global, but, but there are also kind of a, a previous step where global policies impact the UK kind of baseline, yeah? So what, what we can think about is, Kind of first developing a baseline where you know other countries um continue with the policies that they currently do and then uk also um does specific policies and then seeing how you know trade patterns and and, and other like diets evolve within this baseline then just without uh impacts of climate change then on top imposing the impacts of climate change as as you have discussed both in uk and in the rest of the world and, and here, apart from yield uh, impacts on yields, uh, there are of course other dimensions that that uh, can be implemented, like uh, uh, heat labor stress, and and also sea level rise, and also, um, for instance, implications of, of uh, different tipping points, uh, like the work done with um, Simon Diaz and, and his colleagues. So uh, how you know this this framework can be. Kind of extend it as much as uh, you wish to, depending on on what particular aspects you would like to focus on. Um, so this would give like a baseline with uh, an impact of um, of uh, climate uh, with climate impacts. Yeah, and then after this, a uh, different mitigation scenarios can be considered. So uh, um, so one point. Um, that can be also bring into is mitigation. What's what is happening in in other sectors? Yeah, because so you are focusing mostly on agriculture and and on on land based mitigation. But of course, you have has a, a net zero commitment. So the mitigation in in other sectors would need to be happen, including in energy, in transportation, and that would also impact agriculture. Like uh, a simplest example would be price of nitrogen fertilizer. Yeah, so. Uh, it's based on gas, uh, gases, natural gas is a main input. We have a carbon price increase of, let's say, $100. It translates into 100% increase in nitrogen fertilizer. So this would also impact the cost of, of uh, agriculture production practices, yeah? Um, so I think if, if it would be in some way possible to, to take into account these kind of linkages between mitigation in, in other sectors and mitigation in, in agriculture and land-based mitigation, that, um, that might be useful. And, and from this follows another aspect is um, implications for uh, for households, yeah? So, because we know that the lower income household spends a relatively high share on both energy and food, yeah? 
So when when two mitigation policies are combined, this can potentially result in, in regressive implications for uh, for households. And, and I think here's policymakers would definitely be interested kind of what these implications could be and, and what could be their policies or measures to kind of lower the potential this, uh, this regressive distributional impacts. And, and then we can consider some economic measures uh, you know, like specific payments or um, other support measures. And then, of course, looking into what particular households should receive them and uh, and, and related um, kind of aspects. Um, so uh, also in and, and of course, mitigation in the rest. So depending on how the rest of the world acts, it would also impact the, the uh, UK framework. Yeah. So whether uh, whether other countries, including developing countries, whether they proceed with the relative ambitious mitigation measures, including also land land based mitigation, yeah, because that would kind of constrain the food supply in general, yeah, and 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 increase uh, prices of food, kind of um, overlapping with the uh, impacts of the UK uh, like policy. So whether let's say China or India would would have an ambitious mitigation plans and, and it would kind of impact trade from the global to local side, yeah, apart from the uh, feedback in, in the other direction. So I think that's, that's also an important aspect because depending on whether kind of developing countries free, free ride or whether they proceed with ambitious mitigation measures, this might have a, a quite a substantial impact uh, um, on results. Um, so also, I, I would like to mention uh, several ongoing developments that can be linked to the work that you are doing and that is currently being implemented by, by the members of, of the GTAP network. So one particular development uh, which we have just recently released is the GTAP nutritional database. And there we represent um, explicitly uh, nutritional supply, so calories and, and nutrients across different uh, food categories uh, and, and across different, um, um, of course, covering all countries. So and explicitly tracing them embodied into trade and also domestic supply. So um, this allows to target the specific diets or you know, trace impacts of specific policies uh, on the diets. Uh, and so uh, another related development is that we are currently um, developing a new um, database with non-CO2 marginal abatement cost curves based on the EPA 2019 study, kind of parametrizing those uh, in, into the models. Um, and, and finally, also just to mention that uh, we have an upcoming release of the next GTAP database, GTAP 11 with 2017 reference here. So, I know what is the timeline of your project, but potentially uh, this would be kind of the newest and the most recent database that can be um, considered and, and um, implemented in the GDAP framework. Um, yeah, so I, I'll stop here, but yeah, just again to mention, it's really a great and very interesting you know, project and they see a lot of opportunities for kind of this collaboration between uh, networks, so it, yeah. Really, really interesting. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. I, I want to mention now, and Steve may mention a little bit more later, that um, that uh, the Exeter team has actually offered to support, maybe even host. I'm not sure. Early career researchers in this effort, so so there may be an element there of uh, very much hands-on support. So that's exactly what uh, we're you know, supporting under Glassnet. Uh, next uh, discussant, Aline Mosnier. She's the scientific director of FABLE, where FABLE stands for the Food, Agriculture, Biodiversity, Land Use, and Energy Pathways Consortium. Now, FABLE's super interesting and relevant to this uh, UK project, uh, the Net Zero Plus project, because it, quote, develops rigorous quantitative national pathways towards sustainable land use and food systems by 2050. So uh, uh, be great to hear from you, Aline, how this, this matches up with what uh, the uh, Sabrina, uh, Ian and Brett are doing in the UK. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much uh, for the nice introduction and for the floor. So I, I really appreciated your presentation. So, so thanks a lot, very exciting project indeed. 
I'm always super impressed by uh, the coverage of all the different pillars of sustainability and how you were able to connect all the different models, which all look like super innovative tools. So this is something I, I would be really interested to learn more. Um, I'm also very curious about your emulator, I have to say, and how you're going to be going to, to, to work with your stakeholder engagement. So this also, I think that, uh, that there should be some, some follow-up discussion on that, I think with Fable in general. Then maybe just a quick remark, it's more out of curiosity, it's not really maybe something you want to focus on today, but I think that you, in this description of the project, also you highlight how you cover also the social aspects. And I was thinking about uh, this adoption of uh, tree planting uh, by farmers in the UK and maybe if they have already experience in, in, in planting trees on farms. So if it's kind of mixed farms where they have already crops and trees exist, because I can think that this could be potentially a big barrier because it's quite different than crop farming or livestock farming. So this, I would be interested just to see how you take that into account in, in your framework. Uh, it was not super clear from your presentation, but also because it was very detailed, so I might have missed that. Maybe now I'm um, to, to focus a bit more on this uh, leakage aspect, um, because also it's something I, I've also worked more in the past, and maybe I can share some, some experience a bit, both with uh, Globiome, because I worked a lot on, on this leakage effect with, with the Globiome model, especially for biofuels, for example, policies, and then also with, uh, with Fable. So I think that, of course, like for the, the leakage, so sometimes we are tempted to connect also again very complicated models and, and trade is very complex. And, uh, and I think that there is always a risk of building something super complex for very, very, very small effects uh, at the end or something which is, of course, very interesting uh, intellectually. But just I think it, it would be good to, to, to have some tests before to really check uh, where we we expect these big magnitudes, uh, this big impact on uh, on the rest of the world or from the rest of the world to the UK, so that you can already target some scenarios or or really put the efforts there to ensure that there are some interesting results coming out of that. But also, um, I was thinking about uh, most of the time when I did these uh, studies with with Globiome, uh, leakage was really something that we would look at at the end. So it would not be part at all of our scenarios design. Uh, so for example, where to do things. And I think that one of your key questions for you is where to plant trees. And I was wondering, because at the end leakage, it will really depend on which products it will substitute or whether the trees will substitute or replace. And these products could be either products that are targeted, for example, through dietary change as something that anyway, uh, UK wants to reduce the production. So then in this case, you avoid leakage. And so I think the data, dietary scenario will be quite interesting. And this is something also I think that our UK team in Fable has, has explored, and I think Alison Smith is on, on the line, um, to free land and to avoid this leakage. And, and second, uh, there are some products, I'm sure that the UK is more efficient to produce them compared to the rest of the world in terms of GHG intensity. And this could be part of the of, of the decision first where to allocate uh, your trees to avoid replacing these products which are more efficient than the rest of the world. And then already there you would avoid some, some leakage or at least reduce the risk of leakage. And I think that could be something interesting to, uh, to, to check or investigate before doing all the complex linkage of the models and at the end, okay, there is leakage. So maybe this is uh, one, one area that uh, I wanted to, to highlight. And then uh, another area, but I think that Maxim already pointed to that is indeed the leakage depends a lot on what is going to happen in the rest of the world and what kind of policies are going to be put in place, what kind of dietary change will be there and, and so on. So I think that you highlighted the, the importance of climate change impacts in the rest of the world also, and, and I agree, but equally important are indeed these assumptions on how the te technological change or productivity will increase in the rest of the world, especially developing countries. And this is something not super easy <laughs> to, uh, to tackle, but we know that there are large impacts. 
And also for, for Fable, we, we played with simplistic scenario, but of course this uh, policy, which will be on uh, the constraints and the expansion of agricultural land. So for example, some forest codes, some the fact that no deforestation policies, no peatland conversion policies, these kind of things can really reduce the GAG intensity also of the production somewhere else. So if you um, measure the leakage with these policies in place or not, we'll have big, big, big impacts. So I think this is something maybe that where also some collaboration with Fable could be interesting is to, once you have identified also potentially where are the countries that could uh, produce your imports, your higher imports for some of the commodities, maybe check or have a discussion with these countries in terms of what are the policies and this age uh, to reduce their maybe GG intensity in the future and how likely it is to happen. So that's uh, one thing. And also <clears throat> you want to use GTAP, uh, a model. And I think that also here, um, so I'm, I'm not an expert in, uh, in this model, but uh, CG models, I think, operate with this Armington elasticity for trade. So I think that indeed uh, this is something to be uh, quite aware also from the beginning, especially if you want to project something more in the long term. Uh, the Armington are a bit rigid, uh, so you won't have big change in your trade allocation. And I think this is something maybe also you want to um, to try to, 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 to see how it will impact um, your, your results at the end. And if indeed you would use something more flexible or a different type of model, how, how this could affect your total um, leakage. Maybe I can stop here for now and to give space for the overall discussion and for you to reply. Thank you very much, Alain. Perfect. The next one here from Christoph Wimmer, who's at Pitt Institute for Cognitive Research, where he's the group leader for uh, land use and museums, and specifically appropriate to this discussion, he's also the uh, leads the uh, co-leads of the Global Gridded Crop for comparison. Thanks, over to you, Christoph. Gotcha. I just found it very difficult to hear you just then. I don't know if that was just me. No, it was also difficult to hear for me, but I... Okay, I, well, uh, just Chris, 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 sorry about that. I got, almost have my microphone in my mouth, but anyway, the, uh, Christoph is, uh, leads the Global Gridded Crop Modeling Intercomparison Project, and uh, please tell us how that relates to this one. And, uh, Christoph is at PIC, the Potsdam Institute for Climate Research. Thanks, Christoph. Thanks, Carter, for the introduction and Thanks to all the presenters and discussants so far for the very interesting input. First of all, I want to chime in with, with the applauding for the very holistic and, and detailed and comprehensive approach that you pursue. So I, I think every keyword that I was thinking of earlier <laughs> that could be mentioned was mentioned. So that <laughs> that's uh, very promising, but also very challenging to kind of put that into practice, I suppose. Um, I do want to start with, with a um, more uh, conceptual thought that you're promoting green carbon as a solution to, to go to net zero or net zero plus even, which means you, you, the idea is to store carbon that was stored in, in fossil reserves in terms of biomass and soils in the biosphere. And that has the problem that it's that it is not necessarily as permanent as uh, coal in the soil, and it is also has limited capacity over time. So you can basically only buy time with that, um, which is good. Yeah, that's, that's great. <laughs> and you also pointed to to the co benefits of uh, with for recreation and biodiversity and and what have you. So there's, uh, that's certainly something to, to consider, but it should be also very clear that the, the rates that you get when you replant a plot will at some point diminish to zero. So the, the uh, mitigation rates. And so there, there must be some concept beyond that in, in the end, if the UK wants to go to net zero. 
Um, but yeah, the the second point, and that was already basically touched upon by Aline and also Maxim in, in their comments, is that from the design or from the idea of the project, you are very UK focused and um, the dynamics in the rest of the world are basically a side constraint. But as Aline said, it could be that the dynamics in the rest of the world are much more important than any diet change that you could have in the UK. Uh, and therefore, I, I like this idea of Aline that it would be very interesting to maybe just make a sensitivity analysis upfront saying, okay, let's assume, and you can do an informed assumption from all the scenarios that are out there, like what is the worst case outer world state and what's the best case outer world state in terms of agriculture demand, in terms of agriculture production and, um, and uh, climate, right? you name it. And that, yeah, I think th there's a real danger that, that these rest of the world dynamics dwarf the dynamics that you can capture in very detailed modeling of the UK. And um, yeah, that, that would just be a pity if, if, if that would then in the end be, because I know from the global crop modeling that these models and, and climate scenarios in combination can get you any answer that you would think of. Uh, unfortunately, to our great dismay, that uh, uncertainty is huge. And from large increases in productivity to very large decreases in productivity, you basically can have any case. And in order to capture that uncertainty and that bright, a broad variety of, of options, um, that can keep you busy for the rest of the project. And you need to make a, a, a decision how to, how to tackle that. I like the idea of, of this risk perspective, which kind of allows you to, to um, slim down these, these uh, uncertainty cases a little bit, I, I hope at least. And I think this smart design, scenario design is, is key here, at least for the rest of the world. If you want to put your very detailed machinery for the UK to work, interacting with the rest of the world, you probably need to slim down to some very sizable set of scenarios of what the rest of the world does. And, and um, yeah, I, I could imagine that that could also profit from the GlassNet network, like discussing what kind of um, representative cases there are and, and what, what other sectors that are relevant for for the decision making in the UK for the price signal for uh, the the demand that can be satisfied domestically or externally also the demand from externally that the UK could supply to and all that um, it's probably best to to just have a small set of scenarios to cover these corner stone, stones of, of the possible ranges um, yeah, having said that, like uh, coming back to, to where I feel most comfortable uh, to agriculture modeling. So you, you also mentioned that and you also mentioned uh, that all the things change with management and management does change with climate as well. And I was curious if there, if you have any good mechanisms of how you could project how farmers and land managers respond to changing climate conditions, not just to incentives in terms of subsidies or uh, some other regulation, but, but that's also that they respond to their changing environment, which is um, not well covered in crop modeling in general, I, I have to admit. <laughs> But I think it's it's uh, important to to consider that. And if you say you want to address the management dimension explicitly, as I understood, that would be a, a very interesting aspect for me. And since we had, or you also mentioned emulators, uh, I could also promote a, a set of crop model emulators that we developed for the global scale that can be 
basically applied to inform your global scenarios if you want. They, they're lightweight enough that you could also plug them in into some equilibrium model if you would want to, and you could combine them, scale them, aggregate them to whatever units you, you like to. So that's that could be handy if if you wish to explore that dimension more. Um, yeah, and and but I, maybe as as the last point, um, I was curious how how the interaction is with the actual decision makers in the end because decision making under uncertainty was highlighted. And I mean, that's what decision making is for. If there's no uncertainty, then decision making is usually quite easy. But um, the like, how would you? So I'm not I'm not very knowledgeable about that. But like, how to communicate the uncertainty and and this cornucopia of future possibilities that that you will find? How you can communicate that to decision decision makers? and provide them enough information about the uncertainty and the risks that they can actually make a good decision and not just kind of, oh, okay, it's 100,000 options. I take the middle ground or I take business as usual because I'm overtaxed with the richness of, of things that you provide. And I think that's a real danger for your project with so many details and so many aspects that it will actually hamper decision making because I would feel paralyzed if I have so many options to choose from or to kind of decide for myself what is the most likely case that I think would come out there. So I think that that's also a great challenge you have to, you know, or you will be challenged with. And I stop here. Thanks. Thank you, Christoph. I think your last point is also echoed in the chat a little bit. We realize there's many directions the analysis can take, so I had to rein that in. So finally, our last discussant, uh, uh, Steve Pulaski, he's a professor of, of ecological environmental economics at the University of Minnesota in the Department of Applied Economics, also in the Department of Ecology. And he's uh, also very well known among many of us as co-founder of the, the Natural Capital Project. So over to you, Steve, thanks. Great. Thanks, Carter. Uh, thanks, Sabrina and Brett and Ian. Um, fascinating to hear the details of the project or more of the details of the project. I've, I've heard bits and pieces at various places, and uh, I'll just uh, echo others. It's super interesting project. You have a great team, um, and um, I, I expect great things from all of you uh, at the end of the day when you when you finish this project. Um, I'll just mention uh, something before getting into um, uh, some of my comments. Um, Carter had mentioned that there's a possibility for early career researchers. So part of the GlassNet, um, uh, part, part of our networking is to try to promote exchange with early career researchers. So there's an opportunity uh, for an early career researcher to be uh, to work with the Net Zero team. Um, I think this is fabulous. So, you know, if you if you are an early career researcher or you know of some people, um, uh, you know, have them get in touch with, uh, with GlassNet leadership, we'd be happy to set this up. So Tom, I don't know if this is through you, uh, probably, um, good. Um, anyway, as I say, it's a great opportunity and it's something that we really take seriously. We, we really, you know, part of GlassNet is to increase the exchange among networks, much as we're doing um, today. Okay, so I, I, I wanna, um, start Oops. get my mute button that won't help um i, I want to start with this uh linking to decision making because i think um you have um a truly um wonderful opportunity more so than many of us integrated modelers that you you have a direct in to the uk government on this and you know they're coming to you with this project um, and so, you know, it's it's hard to um, underemphasize you know, the importance of the fact that you have this, uh, you know, green futures plan and uh, the green brook. Uh, so, you know, this this notion of natural capital is already into planning and government decision making. Um, so you're not swimming; it's tied on this. That's wonderful. Um, 
So, you know, both on the, the kind of, in working with decision makers, both on the front end, like what is it that they want? Um, and, you know, what is kind of information that's most useful to them? Then also, you know, once you've done your analysis, like how do you provide information in a timely way that fits into the kind of framework that they need? You know, so, um, you know, a, a lot of the work uh, I know that Brent has done um, and others to really um, take that seriously. I, I know that, you know, I just think, oh, well, I've produced results and I've published it in a journal. Great. But it, it, as you know, that there's so much more work involved in actually making this the kind of information that they need and in a form that they can actually use. So, you know, again, I, I know you know the importance of this, but um, just to encourage, you know, don't, don't slack on the decision support tools. Um, okay. Um, the, the second comment is, you know, really thinking about, so GlassNet, we really are thinking about um, how do we go local to global and global to local, and you talked about that, but also um, links across these different networks and where um, different um, people can, can, can help. Um, you know, I, I won't say more. I mean, Maxime has already covered, you know, some comments from GTAP, and that's the most obvious one. There are spillover effects in terms of this market, uh, you know, so if you change. Although I have to say, I'm really struck by uh, Aline's comment that, you know, how large is this going to be? So, you know, the difficulty of the analysis and the size of the effect, um, that's worth thinking through um, uh, really carefully. Um, but I'm also thinking about, you know, what, what, are there, what other kinds of leakage effects or impacts um, are they? And, you know, Ian, you know, we're, we're charged with actually thinking about spillover effects. Um, so, you know, besides carbon, I'm obviously from, from the natural capital project perspective, I'm interested in um, impacts of, of changes in one area, so you know, we now encourage tree planting. Well, what does that mean for other ecosystem services and natural capital? You know, are there are there strong co-benefits with water? Are there uh, air quality benefits? What happens to biodiversity? You know, you mentioned um, working with Andrew Baumford, who's excellent on thinking about biodiversity. Um, and you know, primarily, I think this is going to be within the UK. I mean, there will be obviously Lynn use changes elsewhere. So, so there will be knock-on effects elsewhere, but you know, I think the largest effects will be uh, within the UK, but I would imagine that the UK government would be quite interested um, in that. But if you're interested, we can, we can talk further about you know, other kinds of um, co-benefits or co-costs um, and, uh, and some of the modeling, I'd actually be quite interested in, in talking with you um, about that. And then also how, how those link potentially with uh, the market impacts uh, with GTAP. So, you know, if you change uh, water quality and that has an impact, you know, maybe that triggers rules on what can and can't be done in certain watersheds, which also has additional, you know, constraints or impacts on markets. So anyway, uh, but the caution, of course, as other people have said, there's, there's numerous different ways that this project can go. And you should think about uh, so, so Alina, I'm going to give you credit for this, but you know, really think carefully about what what effects are going to be largest. What what are the ones that are most interesting to um, to pursue um, at least first? You know, sort of first order effects, and leave the other ones for uh, future projects. Um, the last thing that I want to mention is um, I, I'm really struck by the fact that you have such great data, such great local data down to the farm level. Um, that really opens up uh, a whole lot of things uh, that you can do. And one of the things I'm really struck by, I mean, you know, you can do a fabulous job of thinking about like, what is the opportunity cost or what, you know, how much do you give up, um, you know, when farmers stop planting crops or doing livestock, I mean, you, you have a, you, you have a really good handle on what that opportunity cost is. And that's, most projects don't have that. Um, so that's great. I, I was wondering if you could push a little bit further. I mean, of course, I would start with profit maximization. I'm an economist, so I would start there. But, you know, most most farmers are, they have utility functions, which don't have solely profits. Um, and so, you know, if you could think about and the fact that you've got such detailed information, you actually have such good contacts, you know, you could think about a more, 
I don't want to say realistic necessarily, but you know, other kind of behavioral models and empirically, how how well do they they test out? You know, what what is it that's motivating farmers? And and then particularly then, how are they going to react to policy? Right. So um, is it simply like, oh, I can get you know a penny more by changing, therefore I'll do it? You know, probably not. So anyway, um, just an encouragement there. I was really struck by Brett's comment about taking in uh, risk aversion. Um, it would also be interesting to take into account discounting if you're making capital decisions. My question here, so I am really supportive of this. I think it's, I think it's super interesting. I think it's also super difficult, not only because characterizing the uncertainties that the farmers are facing, you know, other people have already mentioned. So Christoph mentioned uh, some of these, Lean mentioned some of these, um, you know, like what's happening in the rest of the world, climate impacts, so forth, policy impacts, uh, you know, policies may change. So um, how to actually take that into account empirically and sort of credibly. Uh, uh, I'm curious to see how you will do that. I, I'm fully supportive because I think it's really interesting, but um, I, I think it's really challenging. Um, so, um, and then the last thing I just, this is really small point. Well, maybe not small point, but um, at least in places like Minnesota, uh, a lot of um, really important um, car terrestrial carbon is what happens with peatlands. And I know you've got a lot of peatlands. And so, you know, this isn't necessarily just about planting trees, but treating, um, tre treating peatlands. And I know nothing about really the uh, UK peatlands or policies or whatever, but it just struck me as that, that that's a, a potentially really large source of carbon. So anyway, that um, this is a great project and I really look forward to seeing how uh, it progresses. Thanks. Thank you, Steve. Okay, great. We have uh, 25 minutes. We're within five minutes of our target. I think uh, we probably should go straight back to the team and hear some responses. Um, maybe take 10 minutes across the three of you as you wish, and then we'll open it up again. Thanks. Seems pretty really good. Um, Sabrina, do you want to start? Um, and uh, and just maybe give quick responses and, and then Brett and then me. Or where any order. Yeah, okay, great. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think um, those were really fantastic comments across the board. Um, like for the part um, on the local global links, I, I agree that it's important to factor in what happens in the rest of the world. Um, and we should think carefully about what realistic scenarios would be um, that we may want to model um, and what other policies may be in the rest of the world. Um, and I'm really also grateful um, for all the comments on um, GTAP modeling choices, static and dynamic, uh, and so on and so forth, um, that we could make um, and um, for the idea to start with a back of the envelope, so to say, a leakage estimate um, uh, before we go into a full-fledged analysis. So those were all um, really fantastic. So I think there were a couple of clarification questions on interactions with decision makers um, and how we deal with uncertainty where I think Ian and Brett are probably in the best place um, to take those. Um, well, I, I hope this has been recorded because uh, I think even if this is the only interaction we have with the class, that has been incredibly useful. Um, I'm sitting here feeling a little bit stupid, actually, because I really think I've been thinking about it so local from UK out and not the other way around or in the context of everything else that's been going on. That just some of the things that have come across from the, uh, the, the discussants there has been, has been really, really just useful. That the, the idea that the changes that happen in the UK might be driving changes overseas is the way I was thinking about it. Now, I have to say that Eric and Sabrina haven't been thinking about it. That's probably just me. But the thought that we should be considering uh, the fact that the rest of the world might change. My God, I sound so old school English here. Like that. There is a, the rest of the world is just fantastic. And I think those might be much more interesting things to pursue, the effect of change in the rest of the world. Likewise, we're I'm deeply involved in other projects looking at other mitigation efforts be that through bio crops or cap carbon capture storage or industry or you know uh, mitigation measures across industry and transport we're deeply involved in those we haven't really thought about how those tie together so both those uk wider things and the global wider things are really important for us to go away and think about again um 
all the other things that Sabrina said, you know, the thoughts about how we use GTAP and which particular shade of, uh, of CGE model we, we might interact with will be uh, critical and really useful. I think one of the things uh, Sabrina mentioned, um, trying to uh, answer some questions, I think one of the things to be clear on it is that we are building decision support tools here, not really models. And, and certainly uh, we're attempting to move away from the idea that we can model the future. We have to be able to do that to some degree, but we really want to attempt to uh, it embrace, capture, uh, describe as best as possible our uncertainty at this point in time when these decisions are being made by policymakers in the UK and by other organisers in the UK, how uncertain we are about the future. Now, um, was it Christoph? I think Christoph answered, how on earth do you get that certainty across to decision makers? Oh, um, I've tried, I think probably we've all tried before to present science data or economics data with uncertainty and confidence intervals. And my experience, I assume very similar to others, is either they take the uh, middle value you've given them and that goes into the summary which goes to the minister which then gets uh, used throughout policy if, if you're lucky or they look at the uncertainty and think we just can't process that it we won't use this information that science not good enough um, that's the way they think about it so we're really trying to change our approach here and say well that uncertainty is part of the, the what we have to do we have to process that uncertainty for them and try and understand what the range of outcomes are. And really with a land use problem like this, we really are thinking about it like a portfolio problem. How would one decide to uh, employ trees as a greenhouse mitigation strategy, given the fact that what we do with these trees, where we plant them or which species we plant and how many we plant might give good or bad outcomes, depending on what the future looks like. And that's really not something I think anyone is capable of, of processing. So with, certainly within this project, we're looking to move to uh, using techniques which come out of uh, sort of financial economics to look at that whole range of outcomes and say, well, what's a good strategy? What's a sort of risk averse strategy for planting, which does pretty well, no matter what happens in the future? And we, we, we already know in the UK, if you decide to plant conifers, they do great if it's wet and cold. If you decide to plant uh, uh, broadleaf oak trees, they're going to do uh, tragically badly if it's wet and cold, but they'll do great if it's hot and dry. So what do you advise to policymakers? You advise hedging your bets, plant some of both. Now, we want to take that same principle, and I think that's an easy example, and say that's true of all the other things. We've got to think about what policies are going to be like, what diets are going to be like, and, and try and work this, uh, this, this recommendations of how you should uh, proceed with a tree planting policy in recognition of the fact that the future is vastly uncertain, but these decisions are being made now. And that, that, that's our challenge. So answering to both Christoph and Steve and, and the others who have responded, yeah, it is about how do we advise decision makers now, not necessarily thinking what is the best model of the future. We just want to understand that full array. So I'll stop there because we've only got a few minutes, but thank you so much for the input. And I hope we can take a lot of these things further. Uh, if I can come in, uh, well, first of all, I want to repeat what uh, both Sabrina and Brett have said. That was fantastic. I mean, we're not saying this to be a secret. You, you know, you'll, we don't get to talk to people who really know what they're talking about with regard to trade. You know, so we're used to going into meetings where uh, we, kind of get, we know what we're talking about. And, uh, and, and in this one, we, I think we just realised straight away. Uh, just how much um, uh, of a rich resource uh, Glassnet could be. So, uh, again, repeating its uh, uh, admission. Yeah. Yeah. Can you speak towards the mic? You're really breaking oh, up. Sorry. Thanks. Sorry. I'm re yeah, I'm reading my notes at the same time. Sorry. I'll, I'll, I'll add lib. I think the point made by virtually every... Uh, commentator that you need to perhaps take a little bit of account of the rest of the world that isn't the UK. <laughs> That's pretty good advice. You know, we definitely need to to do that. Um, um, uh, it sounds a bit imperialist uh, that we that we haven't really put that top of the list uh, to date. Um, I would very much welcome the chance to talk uh, maybe a little bit more with. Uh, 
uh, Aileen, uh, maybe uh, Tom put something in the, in the chat as well about, right, how do we do that? What's, what's the simple, uh, almost back of the envelope um, uh, test that you would advise that we do uh, just to try and get a feel for how big these magnitudes are? Um, there are so many comments here, um, I can't get to all of them, but let me just um, perhaps finish with talking about the one that Steve said about, uh, you know, profit maximisation. Um, I completely agree with you. Um, you know, we, we do start with uh, profit maximisation, but say with the with the stuff that we've already been working on in the past, the econometric stuff, th that's exactly what we did. We started off with profit maximisation and then, you know, given the data that we had, nowhere near as good as what we got for what Brett's doing, what can we do? And, and, um, and straight away, you get some really interesting results. So, for example, uh, a pound received from a policymaker is not as good as a pound received via market prices. Um, you immediately see that there's an extra margin that is needed because of this unfamiliarity. Um, and for very good reason. So, you know, the the British government has a fabulous record of putting policies out there and then three or four years later just stopping them. You know, so, you know, this is this is not crazy. Um, uh, you, you might well be able to make uh, more profit by um, uh, shutting down your dairy and planting trees next year. But what if they pull it the year after? Yeah, so, um, uh, yeah, I fully agree. I think we can do a lot with the data that we've got that doesn't require us to sort of completely uh, go into um, some sort of dreadful um, uh, uh, discursive response approach with five farmers. You know, so I, I think we can do uh, something on that. Oh, and we'll just also uh, end on the peatlands thing. So what's actually happening here this is part of um well this is the part of the second program of research that's gone on for that the first program was all about actually the really big stuff the reducing the emission side um this one uh the greenhouse gas removal program is all about trying to close that gap by 2050 such that even if you put in all the emissions reduction programs that everybody signed up to you'll still have a gap between uh it, well you'll still have positive emissions unless you take it out uh and one of the other uh projects in this program is is purely on peace and we're, we're working with them on a uh, a collaborative uh proposal um because peatlands in the uk i don't know what the situation in the us but here from a carbon point of view the history has just been absolutely crazy so you know we have drained and burned and uh, removed peat at an astounding rate uh, in this country and uh, if we can just stop the degradation of it that would be a huge improvement you know um so um yeah there, there is other work that's going on on that i'll, I'll pass back to uh to maybe tom and uh Thanks. Please, whoever wants Sorry, to jump in, just uh, no, no problem. Uh, Tom, would be great to hear from you and your hands up. And um, anyone else, just put up your hand, and we'll we have fifteen minutes. Tom. Yeah, thanks all. This is a great workshop. This is the first one. We wouldn't weren't sure how it would work out, but it's terrific. I'm really appreciating everyone's contributions. Um, I I just wanted to add one. Sitting back here and thinking about. Uh, this massive um, tree planting exercise. I guess, in my mind, I'm 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 wanting to hear from some forestry people. I'm wanting to hear what are you going to do with the trees? Are they commercial uh, ventures? Are they going to be dumped on the market? Is the timber going to be dumped on the market in 20 years? Um, uh, um, a market which may not even exist now, um, or um, are they going to be nurtured into old age and and whatnot? So I, I think I see the big market impact coming from the forest products directly. What happens with those? And um, could be really a dramatic event um, in the in the global forest products market, or depending on which 
way they go, whether it's paper or pulp or something else, um, could be a huge event. Oh, I just also wanted to second that point about the survey. Um, we're trying to keep track of you guys <laughs> and trying to improve. And so please do check, as Carter indicated, chart, uh, um, check that survey. And the first page is just IRB stuff. You can skip it and then answer the questions. Thank you. We're happy to have a quick response to Tom on that. So we're working with our forestry commission here, part of the group, who um, have models that uh, suggest what might happen to products, uh, to wood products that come out of it. It seems to me, working with the, the UK government, that they're expecting these to be very long-lived forests, almost, almost uh, not commercial forestry it's not clear this is going to be an option that we're going to explore as well with the policymakers. should we go for commercial forestry are we just creating uh, woodland habitat which will uh, in the views of government be widely accepted in the country and uh, create wonderful recreational facilities for everyone as well so you're right i i'm not clear that our understanding of what happens to those timber products is sufficient and again this is part of the interactions uh, you know, at the moment we import most of our timber from overseas. You know, I think we, we bring a lot in from Scandinavia. Um, so, yeah, we, we have to understand more about that. And it's an, another very good point uh, concerning our interactions internationally, what's going to happen to the timber. Anyone else wanting to jump in with a question or comment? Uh, if I could, oh, sorry, yeah, I'll, I'll wait. Go ahead, yeah, go ahead. Oh, all, all I was going to, I, I had this uh, uh, fear that we were going to um, uh, finish uh, us, uh, before I could just repeat uh, just how keen we are to uh, collaborate with people here. As uh, I think it was Steve said, you know, that there is the potential actually for even uh, directly getting together. Uh, so please do. Uh, keep that in mind, um, and more uh, more conveniently, if there was a way to talk in the future, maybe with um, say Elaine, you you definitely seem to have some uh, ideas on what we ought to be doing that we're very happy to pursue. Uh, we'd be keen to do that. So anything that can be said about how we keep this going, I'd be very interested in. Maxim. Uh, yeah, I, I just had two brief thoughts on, on what has been discussed so far. So in terms of uh, leakage, I was thinking that um, you can implement and trace kind of production versus consumption based emissions accounting in your framework. And, and then it would also help to link to the uh, you know, green accounting, UN environmental accounting framework. So just to see how emissions differ from the consumption versus production point of view. And this essentially kind of completely covers the, the leakage aspect. Yeah. And, and, and for instance, in, in GTAP, this can be done through tracing emissions along the value chains and kind of estimating how much emissions are embodied into each commodity imported and exported. Yeah. So um, another point is that to, to get kind of a brief, um, well, yeah, first kind of order understanding of what these leakage implications could be, uh, one can also estimate emission multipliers for, for, for each commodity just from a specific, you know, reference year or a future year. And then with these, having these emission multipliers, you can get it, an idea of, how you know changes in trade patterns can can impact potential uh, leakage. So yeah, just just these two points. Great. Any other hands up, Brad? Yeah, just uh, another thing which has sort of concerned us along the way, though it's whether it'll interest us, you makers or not. Clearly, when we uh, leak carbon or greenhouse gases, there's a direct effect on the constituency of the decision makers we're talking to, but there will be presumably also effects on a whole range of other ecosystem services, be that water quality, be it flooding, all the things we're looking at in the UK GB context will be impacted by this leakage. And again, I wondered whether there was uh, 
routes to understanding it, quantifying those, which are similar to the route we're taking through um, GTAP for the, the carbon quantification. So again, it's a, it's a limitation of the boundaries of what we're looking at. Steve. Well, just on that question. So Brent, we, in natural capital project, we, we actually have been uh, doing work um, most recently with the World Bank um, to quantify effects of land use change on a variety of ecosystem services kind of across the globe. So, you know, if you have, if you're linked with GTAP and uh, you've got a model that can predict land use change or management change, um, you know, then it can be picked up in, in terms of other models, natural capital project um, invest, but, but there are others, you know, like, um, you know, the, a, a number of people on this call and Fable and, and Pick and, uh, and, and folks in the Netherlands and also, you know, so there are, there are a number of models that would be able to tell you about impacts on other ecosystem services beyond carbon, beyond the UK. Fantastic, Steve. We heard comments from uh, a few people. Christoph talked about sensitivity analysis to help focus on key issues. Elaine talked about sort of simpler, high-level tests. Um, we're worried about almost too much information uh, for the decision makers to digest. Um, no pun intended, but you know, is the is the is the agricultural model down in the weeds and losing track of the global impacts and feedbacks on UK uh, decisions? I just wondered, maybe we could hear a little bit more from the team about how do you sequence or how do you converge on the big picture? Do you build it up from all the all the types of modeling and aspects and uh, potentials that we've talked about to analyze? Or do you start by doing some back of the envelope, trying to focus and really um, sticking to the bigger issues that you can communicate more easily perhaps to decision makers, because they're gonna be interested in the bigger issues. We know that. Don't, don't, don't. Yeah, I mean, I was talking with, uh, with government representatives last week, it's all a blur, making us travel again now, it's terrible. Um, and trying to get across some some fairly big messages in which were really, I mean, one of the big problems we have, and Ian knows about this, is that uh, the government in the UK isn't particularly joined up. So while we're talking to people who are uh, driving tree planting, there's people who are thinking about energy, there's people who are thinking about decarbonisation of transport, and uh, they're not well joined up. And yet a lot of these things are all uh, focused around this land use um, issue. So I think we, we have been doing back of the envelope uh, calculations, some interesting ones. We haven't got time to share them with you, but certainly when we look at just thinking about the, if we imagine that all the food that gets displaced by planting all these trees is simply uh, imported from the countries where we currently import those food from, and we use some of the, uh, the emissions coefficients that are available for those, it changes drastically what we do in this country, because in some we're relatively carbon efficient. We want to keep those in other parts of our agriculture. We're not. And, 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 uh, sorry, yeah, and we're not. And it's much better if we get rid of those parts of agriculture. So we go from uh, you know, getting rid of quite a lot of pasture and uh, livestock. Actually, turns out we get a lot from Ireland who are a lot worse at us than this in terms of CO2 emissions. So getting that message across that this what happens if we start considering displaced CO2 to policymakers and showing that it changes quite drastically the sorts of places in which we'd like to get rid of our, change our agriculture from agriculture to growing trees. That's a, a key message. We're starting to get that across to them. And the other key message is about uncertainty and stopping them pursuing this single-minded idea that you can take two scenarios or three scenarios yeah, and say what's good under a scenario and then choose one of those when really under the uncertainty you have to be thinking about this well I, I described it as a portfolio approach, approach but you've got to hedge against all the possible futures and again those are another key message that we've been trying to get across to them that they have to embrace this uncertainty in these big 
investment decisions being made now and hedge against futures. And that that's perfectly possible. You don't need to uh, uh, think that it's just an impossible problem to solve. So I think we can get those messages across. And you're absolutely right, Carter, having some simple presentations of the scale of these effects with some really quite naive assumptions, but getting us on the road has been useful in getting those messages to everybody. Thank you, Carter. We've heard uncertainty a lot. I'm no expert, but I know the World Bank has done uh, lots and lots on robust decision-making, decision-making under uncertainty. Um, yeah. To the team, are you up to speed on this or is this another area that Glassnet could potentially help? Not just in the analysis, but also in the presentation, <laughs> but also in the pre in the presentation because how you, how you even present uncertainty. A lot of it's about the sequencing of decisions to make the no regrets decisions first, et cetera. Anyway, question back to you. I, I, I think we're, we're expanding our knowledge. We've got some other people in the team. Uh, Frankie Cho, who's, who's coming through with pretty good understanding, but this, it's a large area and we're learning relatively quickly about, uh, about well, issues to do with optimization and uncertainty and sequencing and recourse. It's it's an enormous area. There's a lot more complications into the analysis we're doing. And yes, if there's expertise or advice or people have been down these roads before, we would warmly encourage yeah. them to, to 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 make contact with us. Yeah. Or if okay. you tell us who they are, Carlton, we'll pursue them. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll help you on that. Uh, Tom, any final any final words for the uh, on behalf of uh, Glassnet? Well, thanks, Carter, for chairing this and uh, for doing a great job organizing it, too, and giving everyone marching orders in advance. That was really helpful. Um, oh, I want to thank everyone who's hung around and uh, do click on that survey if you haven't. Um, I would like the uh, if Carter and the discussants could just linger uh, for five minutes. I just wanted to do a quick debrief. But um, thanks again, Sabrina, Ian, Brett. Uh, terrific presentations, exciting project, and I'm sure I was just formatting a little email to you guys. I'm sure others will be doing it as well and we'll be in, in correspondence on this. So keep us posted and we'll be on the lookout for early career researchers who might want to either visit Exeter or maybe you send yeah. someone um, to one of the other institutions. Uh, so we, we wanna promote that, absolutely. Thank you, thank you all. Great. Um, thank you very much for all of your valuable comments. It was really fantastic. Yeah. So I'm really glad we had this opportunity. Well, this is a state of the art. So we're also very interested, as Tom said, to hear how it goes and stay in touch. So thank you. Thank you all very, very much. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye -bye. Very interesting. Bye-bye. Thanks.